Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road. And those who travel it wind up in the gutter, the prison or the grave. There's no other end. But they never learn. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The White Carnation. I can't understand it. Ben Reynolds is a wonderful guy with a really great future, intelligent, handsome... Well, well, you've seen his picture. Yeah, yeah. You said he's a doctor, didn't you, Casey, an MD? That's right. He's already known as one of the best young medical men in town. Uh, uh, turn left at the next corner, Marlowe. Okay. You also said he's to be married soon. Soon. Tomorrow. Oh. And to the swellest girl in the world, Margaret Vanderveer. Vanderveer. As in Beverly Hills, huh? Yes, you know them? Oh, just a name. Marlowe, we've got to locate Ben Reynolds fast and find out what's wrong. Well, you sure it's not just a last-minute case of cold feet? Cold feet. Yeah. Oh, Marlowe, he's in love with the girl. I'm his best man, I know. Besides, uh, this marriage means a lot to the guy's career. He wouldn't run out. It happens, Casey. Oh, not to Ben. Why, he was fine, happy, full of laughs, right up to the minute we went into that flower shop. Flower shop? Yeah, some small place called Steiner's Flowers on Temple Street. Uh, ben and I were driving along there this afternoon when I remember the one thing I'd overlooked was a white carnation for the groom. We stopped and went in. And came the switch. I'll say so. Mm. While I talked to the florist, Ben browsed around the shop. Then all at once, he grabbed me by the arm and said, let's get out of here. He was white as a sheet. We left in a hurry, and all the way up here to his place, he kept looking back like he was afraid of being followed. Well, what'd he say about it? Oh, well, he wouldn't tell me a thing. When we got to his apartment, he gave me a real brush off. I went on home, Then at 7 tonight, I got a call from him. Give me that call word for word if you can, Casey. Well, he said, Tom, listen to me. There's a man named Gregory Toledo. I thought he was dead, but he's come back to life. I can't go on until he's dead again, this time for sure. Please don't interfere or say anything. You'll hear from me. Then he hung up. Gregory Toledo, huh? Was Ben at home then? No, no, I tried to call him back, got no answer. I thought it over for a while, then called you. You see, I'm not only his best man, I, I'm his best friend too. Oh. Uh, that's his place there. Okay, kid. I think you've done right so far, but brace yourself. For what? For something ugly. He says all the earmarks. You might wind up needing lilies, not white carnations. Let's go. The apartment was ground floor, rear, and dark. Inside, from walnut paneling to the sweet, nutty smell of good pipe tobacco, Dr. Ben Reynolds' place was neat, clean, and cozy until we got to the kitchen. There, the air was thick with a strong disinfectant. The doctor's kit was open on the sink. Beside it was a heap of blood-soaked gauze topped by a pair of forceps. And still clamped in the chromium jaws was what looked like a 38 slug. He must have performed this just before he left. Yeah, possibly on himself. This bottle of 100-proof bourbon here is the anesthetic he used. Hey, Marlo. Hmm? The cigarette case here. I've never seen that here before. Marlo, look. What? The name on this thing. Toledo. Yeah, as in Gregory Toledo. He was here, Marlo. Yeah, but now two plus two doesn't quite make four. Look. You say Ben told you on the phone that he couldn't go on until Gregory Toledo was dead. And yet, apparently... Apparently, Ben pulled a bullet out of that Toledo guy right here in this kitchen. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Let's check the other rooms again, huh? See if we can get a lead on where he went. Right. I'll look in the bedroom. All right. I'll start on the desk. See if his clothes are still there, will you? Everything seems okay in here. Good. Oh. Say, uh, Casey, did Ben like Armenian or Hungarian food a lot? No. Not that I know of. Why? Well, because his phone book is open to restaurants and every one of that kind is checked off. Even the gypsy tea rooms. Well, that's funny. He never went to those places. What's it mean? Nothing, maybe. Let's see, he got through them as far as uh, Sarkessian's Gypsy Cellar, 3rd Street. Ring any bell? Not a one. Hmm. What are we going to do, Marlowe? You're going to go home and get some rest. Oh, we've got to find him. That's what you hired me for, isn't it? I'll call you when I've got something. Where are you going now? Steiner's Flower Shop. See what else he stocks beside white carnations. I'll call you, Casey. 
I unsnapped the front door lock, went out to my car, and drove down Temple Street almost to Alvarado. I still had a block to go when I saw the red spotlights on a pair of prowl cars parked up ahead. It was too close to be coincidence. The little store marked Steiner's Flowers was crawling with law. I pushed through the whispering circle of morbidly curious, keeping a respectful distance outside, and went up to the door. There, Detective Lieutenant Matthews spotted me and motioned me in. Hey, Marlow. What brings you here? Business. Stop for a bachelor button. Uh-huh. Well, you're a bit late. The joint's closed. Proprietor's been murdered or so, I think. You think? Can't you tell? All right, let's put it this way. He's dead under suspicious circumstances. Ah, that's one way of putting it. You know there's not a mark on him? Nothing. Mm -hmm. Here, take a look. The back room. All right. There you are. That's him. One Harlan Steiner. There was a gun beside him on the floor, been fired once, very recently. What caliber, Matthews? Oh, 38. And no bullet holes in here, so he might have scored. Hey, why? Just curious. Uh huh. Hey, wait a minute, what's this? Motive, maybe. List of currency denominations and amounts sent over from his bank and dated today adds up to $40,000. Hey, that guy had 40000 bucks cash delivered here? That's right. I didn't realize a small flower business could be that good even on a big day. Oh, at your age, it can't. And there's no sign of that cash around, though. Well, maybe he was robbed, huh? Mm-hmm. By a handsome, well-dressed guy was seen running out of here earlier tonight, though. Mm. Steiner probably died of heart failure from the excitement, so that's that. But why did he have so much dough brought in here in the first place? And how did this get here in the back room? What? This. Oh, cigarette with lipstick. Yeah. <laughs> well, Matthews, even florists are human, you know. So are cops. I've heard. Yeah. Now, give me a straight answer, Phil, huh? Of all the places in town, how come you show up here, this dumpy, out-of-the-way flower shop? I was driving by on my way home, saw your car, so I stopped. Easy I... as that. I could have done that well all by myself. <laughs> Mooney! Yeah? You can have it now. Tell him at the morgue I want a fast job. We've seen all we can here. Okay. All except that at the front door, Matthews. What? Get a load of it. Maybe she's your lipstick. Oh. Are you a friend of Steiner's, miss? I... I'm not exactly, sir. I sometimes buy flowers from him. I see. Were you in here earlier today? No. I haven't been here for several days. What's wrong? Mm -hmm. You'll find out soon enough, miss. Better move along now. Go on. Yeah. You okay? No, she's too dark. Your lipstick's off a blonde. Yes, I know. Well, I guess I'll shove off, too. Take it easy, Lieutenant. Sure, boy. Hey, Phil. What? Look, uh, if you should happen to stumble over 40 grand on your way home... Get in touch, will you? Don't I always? Good night, Matthews. I drove down Alvarado to 3rd Street and turned right. In a few minutes, I was parked in front of a gaudy doorway at the foot of a half a dozen steps dimly lit by a rusty hanging lantern under a sign. It said Sarkessian's Gypsy Cellar. Armenian dishes are specialty Alex Sarkessian proprietor. Inside, the place was a stone floor, imitation oak booths, all empty. The five feet high that Hustle taught me out of a dark corner was Sarkessian himself. The welcome smile dribbled off his face like spilled beer when I said all I wanted was some information. Why you come here for it, eh? What kind of information do you want? On some people, Mr. Sarkessian. Do you know a man named Gregory Toledo? No. Oh, well, how about uh, Reynolds, Ben Reynolds? No. Okay, try... Uh, Never mind, that girl on the billboard there, who's she? Madame Vadena, just like it says, she's on the billboard. What's her real name? Ruby Vadena, she works here. <laughs> works. If somebody wants to call looking at tea leaves in a cup, work. But the customer expects it, the customer is always right. So Ruby Vadena works here, but not tonight. All right, where can I find her? What? Because I saw her a few minutes ago in a certain flower shop. Oh, that's a very good reason. Ah. Now, look, mister, I run a restaurant, not a lonely hearts. You, you should... look, Sarkessi, and your little gypsy's in a murder right up to her big brass earrings. I gotta talk to her right now. A murder? I knew that fake. Oh, that no good. She ruins my business. What kind of appetite can murder give anybody, I ask you? I ask you for the last time, where does Ruby live? In Villa Garibaldi on the end of Reposa Street. Thanks. When you find her, tell Sarkessian says she's fired. She don't come in my place again, you hear? She's washed out. Raposa Street turned out to be a narrow, block-long tunnel on the dark, matted cypress trees, at the end of which Villa Garibaldi squatted like an ancient yellow toad, two stories high. 
I'd gone far enough for my headlights to pick up the clutter on the stairs when Ruby herself stepped out from the trees and headed for the front door. She had enough head start. She was upstairs and at the door before I caught her. Leave me alone. I haven't done anything. Copper, leave me be. I'm no cop, Ruby. Oh, no. Lisa and I saw you at the flower shop. You're not kidding anybody. Is this your door here? Maybe, but you can't get in there without a warrant, copper. So keep it out here and keep it short. What do you want? Who is Gregory Toledo? I don't know. All right, let's try an easier one. What was that florist Holler and Steiner to you? If you're not a cop, what do you care? I'm a private detective, honey, and I care plenty. You know what happened to him, don't you? I think he's dead, if that's what you mean. Mm. He was just a friend, that's all. Oh, no, no. You're not the type of just friends, Doc. I... Hey, wait a minute, sugar. Somebody's in your room. Oh, no. The money. Open the door. Hurry up, will you? I'm trying to. Well, come on, come on. Get out of my way. Reynolds! Ben, stop! Stay back, you... For an instant, I'd seen Ben Reynolds, his face twisted in fear, a package wrapped in green oil paper clenched in one hand. Then he grabbed up the only lamp and smashed it at me. In the dark, I heard him run through the kitchen and out the back door. By the time I got outside, he was gone. I started for my car to follow him, but stopped again. At the sudden sight of a gun barrel shoved out from the shadows between two trees and pointed straight at me. Don't move, fella. Not one inch or I'll kill you. You sound like you mean it. I do. You're not going any farther, fella. Don't try. And whoever you are, forget about the green package. You'll live longer. Yeah, I'll take your word for it. Just tell me one thing, baby. Are you and the doctor a team? That all depends. Now go on. Back the way you came. I've got an appointment with the doc, and I wouldn't want to keep him waiting. Start walking. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, with the outbreak of conflict in the Far East, care stockpile in South Korea has fallen into the hands of the invaders. But orders are being accepted so that the moment the conflict ceases, care will be able to move in with badly needed food and clothing for the distressed men and women of Korea. By cooperating with care today, you can help bring hope to Korea tomorrow. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, the second act of Philip Marlowe, and tonight's story, The White Carnation. When the lady in the dark left for her appointment with the doctor, I knew that my next move should be a tight huddle with the good gray heads at homicide. But I also knew that first there was the matter of Ruby Vardena. I could tell by the way she was coming for me. The kind of enthusiasm you see only at feeding time at the zoo. Where is it? The money. Where did it go? How do Where? I know? You're the fortune teller. Uh, now, what'll it be? Cards, teacup, crystal ball? Uh, or should we just try some plain old-fashioned conversation, Ruby? Huh? How about what? Well, for one thing, 40,000 bucks that won't sit still. For another, your connection with Steiner's murder. The law is just itching to hear about that one. Not the police. I don't want to tangle with them again. I mean... Oh, could be embarrassing talking over the good old days, Ruby, is that it? What do you want to know? You and Steiner and the 40,000, what's the story? Steiner and I were supposed to go away together to be married. He loved me. Hmm. You loved the 40 grand, go on. The money came from the sale of his flower shop. He brought it over here tonight, said he'd be back. When he didn't show up, I, I went to find him. That's all I know. Not enough, Ruby. That shop wouldn't bring 40,000 bucks like you could pass for a school mom. Where'd he get the money? I, I haven't the slightest idea. But I do have a suggestion. Oh? If you can get your hands on the money, which is really mine now, I'll um, split it with you and... Uh... And we could even take a long, long trip, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no dice, baby. I wouldn't sleep nights worrying about my traveler's checks. So long, clairvoyant. When I left the piano shawl beauty with a dollar sign heart, I stopped at a mobile gas station, and while they filled my tank, I made a call back to the flower shop, learned that Detective Lieutenant Matthews had gone down to the morgue. But 20 minutes later, when I was there, I was still a step behind, because Matthews had since gone on to headquarters. However, I was also a step ahead. They had just learned why Steiner had died. Connor, the attendant, was pleased as punch to tell me all about it. 
Hey, you see, Marlo? Right here, the back of the neck. That slap of the hypodermic needle. Hold no bigger than a mosquito bite. Real hard to find. Mm-hmm. Then it was an injection that killed him, Connor, huh? Some kind of poison? Uh, we'll have it tagged in a couple of hours. Want me to let you know what it is? No, no, never mind. I'll be in touch with Lieutenant Matthews anyway. By the way, Connor, mind if I use your phone? Why should I? They don't send me the bill. <laughs> Over on the wall there. Thanks. But, uh, Marlo, huh? no long distance, huh? Oh, no, no. Downtown, Connor. Not another inch. That case, help yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, Marlo, one night some news hawk got on the tube here and talked to his girl in Long Beach for 40 minutes. It was two weeks later we found out it was Long Beach, Long Island, not Long Beach, California. <laughs> hey. Now, my son, Lieutenant Matthews. Marlo Matthews, I'm down at the morgue. Oh, what is it, Marlo? Steiner, or are you still just a wayfaring stranger? No, it's Steiner. Look, Matthews, I found out a couple of things that might help. I figured you would. Who is it, Marlo? Well, so far it could be a Dr. Reynolds, but there's more to it. There always is. Wait there, Phil. I'll be over. Okay, but one thing first, Matthews. Does the name Gregory Toledo is in Ohio mean anything to you? Offhand, no. Why? Where does it fit in? Yeah, well, I'm not sure. When I started, Dr. Reynolds was out to kill Toledo again. It uh, seems he's come back to life. Come back to what? It sounded like you said... I did, I did, yeah. <clears throat> well, we'll talk about it when you get here. So long, Matthews. Hey, uh, pardon me for butting in, Mr. Marlowe, but that's kind of funny. What you said, I mean. Why? It was the name you threw at Matthews, Toledo. You see, I... No, no, it couldn't count. Well, oh, Wait a minute, I... wait a minute, Connor. Huh? What's funny about the name Toledo? Come on, it can count plenty. Oh, it's just a coincidence, that's all. Well, that can be enough. Let's have it. Okay, Marlowe, about six or seven years ago, we had a dead one in here named Toledo. Yeah? The front part I don't recall, but it wasn't that Gregory. Anyhow, the cops shot him full of holes for resisting arrest. What's the kind of funny part? Oh, not much, Marlar. Only you just tied somebody named Toledo to this Steiner here who was killed with a hypo. And? And the Toledo bird I'm talking about was a dope peddler. Dope peddlers, Marlowe, are sometimes real handy with hypo needles. Nothing, huh? No. Not unless it fits tighter. Hey, look, Connor, you keep files here, don't you? Yeah. You could get me an address on the Toledo you're talking about, a first name next to kin, so on, couldn't you? Sure I could. What's more, I'd be glad to, Marlowe. Why, if this meant something, it'd be... Yeah, well, let's get to the files, yeah, huh, Connor? Yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah, sure, this way. Morgan attendant cracks keys. Gosh, I'll be... Uh, right over here. Here we are. Tobias, Tolaco, Toledo. Toledo. Yeah, yeah, Toledo. Here it is, Marlowe. Yeah, let me see that. Uh, Toledo, John Edward, August 18th, 1943... Shot to death by police officers, Celestia's and Hogenberg's. Resisting arrest. Address, 31 Juniper Place, Ocean City, California. Next of kin. Holy smoke, Gregory Toledo, a son. <laughs> Connor, you're a genius. Oh. Now, do one more thing for me, will you please? Yeah, sure. When Lieutenant Matthews gets here, tell him I'm sorry to stand him up, but that if I'm real lucky, he won't be mad at all. Yeah, but Marlo, this address at Ocean City, seven years old. I know, Connor, that's why I said real lucky. I'll see you. The gentleman who answered the door at 31 Juniper Place was about 60. Wore a spotted torn bathrobe that read like a menu and needed a shave, a haircut, and peeping through his torn slippers, I saw a blue jay corn plaster. However, his spirit was bright. Seems he uh, liked having visitors. Yes, sir. You're the manager? Oh, I am indeed. Have been for 18 years. Albert A. Keyline. You were looking for a room, sir? No, just some information, Mr. Keyline. My name's Marlowe. I'm a private detective, and a I... A private detective? Well, come right in, sir. My goodness, don't often get to chat with a man in your profession. No, I... Well, welcome I... the opportunity. Uh... <laughs> I usually keep the living room closed, except on Sunday, but tonight I think we can forget that regulation. Yeah, well, look, I'm... <laughs> the uh, Morris chair there is the best one. Make yourself comfortable. Thank you. Mr. Keyline, did you know John Toledo? Toledo? I most certainly did. Hmm. He stayed here for five years, I'm unhappy to inform you. He was killed on my front lawn there in 1943. It was good riddance to... Oh. Oh, I see why you're here, Mr. Marlowe, but frankly, I expected the police, not a private detective. Well, why should you expect the police? Because not two hours ago, Emma Mallory, my neighbor, saw Greta Toledo over at the amusement pier. Greta Toledo? You mean Gregory Toledo, don't you? I don't think so. 
I would have said Gregory if I meant Gregory. Oh, I don't doubt that for a minute. Besides, that boy'd know better than to come back to Ocean City. It's done him enough harm. I, I said Greta Toledo, John Toledo's daughter, Gregory's twin. Twin. Wait a minute, Mister Keyline. This is important. Greta and Gregory Toledo are twins, and the children of John Toledo. That's right, sir. All three lived here for five years, like I said, and a more different brother and sister you never heard of. Well, different like what? Like heaven above. Careful. And... That other place below, that's <laughs> what. The boy was five. The girl a terror. At 13, she was tormenting Alicast, and at 18, when she left here, she was a brazen hussy. Both went their separate ways from here a week after John was buried. You haven't seen him since? No, except one night about a month later when the boy, Gregory, came here to visit me and ask for all the pictures I had of him and his father and sister. <laughs> I used to be an amateur photographer, you know. The I got a pictures, one time at a, pictures uh, Mr. Uh, Keyline, why did he want them? sentiment. I guess he was kind of soft-hearted. I gave him the whole batch except one of Greta, and I only saved it because the lighting was so good. I've got it right here. I, I took it a couple of weeks before they got John. Look, look, see how the sunlight behind her head gives a soft feeling to the whole picture? Yeah, it's practically a halo. Yes, sir. Very professional. Uh, I'll just take that now, Mr. Marlowe. I might try and improve it someday. Yeah, the best of luck. Keyline, don't move your finger. Hmm? My finger? Well, why not? Uh, Mr. Marlowe, are you sure you feel all right? Frankly, no. But I hope to get better as I go along. Listen, Keyline, that neighbor of yours, that Emma, who said she saw Greta Toledo at the amusement pier, was it the big one off the foot of Surf Street? Oh, it sure was. Emma saw her go behind one of the concessions and take a flight of stairs down to the beach. Which flight of stairs? There's a half a dozen of them, Keyline, think, will you? I don't have to. I know, because Emma said it was the flight by the cotton candy concession. You know, that fuzzy stuff. And he's near the merry-go-round. I'm sure of that because Emma mentioned the merry-go-round. She never leaves out any details, you know. Emma's a thorough... The steps that led down from the cotton candy concession took me to a fairyland graveyard under the amusement pier. Dead carousel animals, horses, sea serpents, dragons that smiled. All broken and bent and piled any side up. Some rusted brown, some of the bilious green discolor of old brass. Then a lot of steel and stone dwarfs who must have belonged to some long ago winter wonderland. Also broken and rusted. But beyond that, the people were real, both of them. One was Greta Toledo. She was the same lady in the dark who had stopped me outside of the gypsy's place. The other was the man I had started out to find. The man who was out to re-kill Gregory Toledo. Dr. Ben Reynolds. Wait a minute, Gregory. What? There's one thing we still have to talk about. Or should I call you Dr. Reynolds? All right, get to the point, Greta. I am. That's why I asked you to meet me here. It's a safe place to talk. What did it talk about? You were shot and I gave you medical attention. You demanded that I get $40,000 that was yours, and I did. You did, hero. But only to keep me from letting everyone know that the fine Doc Reynolds is really Gregory Toledo, the son of a dope peddler. All right, sister mine. What do you want? Just this. You're really on my hook, brother. I got a big news flash for you. I wasn't shot in self-defense tonight. It was while I was committing a murder in a flower shop, some filth named Harlan Steiner. What? Yeah, a murder with a hypodermic needle. I murdered a man who was double-crossing me. Trying to take this $40,000 here. We got it from a sale of opium. He was trying to take this money and run with it in a... Gypsy lady, love. Listen, listen. How tight do you think you can squeeze me? There's an end to everything, even blackmail. Don't you see that? I'd be much worse off as a murder accomplice than exposed as a doctor with a very unsavory family background. Also, Greta, I've got a few moral compunctions. A doctor's supposed to save lives, not destroy them. Then see what you can do about yours, doctor. Don't try it, Greta. Lousy aim, sister. She's dead. Yeah. And so is Gregory Toledo, finally. We better get to the police, Dr. Reynolds. Well, Marlo, you stepped out of turn all right, but you happened to step in the right direction. How? I still don't know. Yes, that picture Keyline showed you out in Ocean City, Mr. Marlowe. It was Greta, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Ooh, this coffee's hot. 
Didn't mean a thing, though, Tom. I'd only seen Greta in the dark at the gypsies. And yeah, then how did it help? Uh, more coffee here, please. Huh? Coffee. Oh, sure. Well, it helped, actually, when Keyline added his finger. That covered the girl's hair. And when I could only see the face... It looked like a man, and you saw not Greta, but her twin brother, Gregory. Wait a minute. Who you knew as Dr. Reynolds from a picture you'd seen earlier? Good work, Marlowe. No, no. Good luck, Matthews. There was Connor in the morgue, a gabby woman named Emma Mallory, Keyline's hobby as a photographer, and, oh, lots of little things. Uh, pardon me, Lieutenant. I, I don't quite know how to say this, but... What about the publicity, the newspapers, and what it'll it do to, uh... Well, Dr. Reynolds being Gregory Toledo. Dr. Reynolds being who? Hey, miss, I'd like that coffee tonight. <laughs> you know, I always did like you, Matthews. Good night, fellas. I got outside. It was pushing four o'clock in the morning. And I was tired of a long night that had been crowded with a lot of death and a lot of people. But I was also looking forward to a lot of life. Good life. For Dr. Ben Reynolds and his bride. So, thinking about them, I drove slowly through the quiet city streets until the black melting into gray in the corners of the sky said... It was almost tomorrow. And then I went home, found a telegram. It was from the groom. Tom Casey and the bride-to-be joined me in saying that there's no doubt as to who the best man really is. Please do us the honor tomorrow at 5 o'clock sharp. Oh, that's nice. Now all I need is one white carnation and... Uh, I wonder where that gypsy girl is. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Paul Dubov, Virginia Gregg, Fritz Feld, Georgia Ellis, Tom Tully, Parley Bear, and John Daner. Detective Lieutenant Matthews is played by Larry Dobkin. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. <laughs> Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time a Skid Row suicide changed into murder. A cobbler with an accent was afraid to call the police. And a hard-boiled Hollywood agent broke into tears. All because one woman kept her whole life between the covers of a big leather book. There's a very charming, very amusing young couple to be found at CBS, the star's address every Saturday evening. They're Liz and George Cooper, and Liz is played by the glamorous Hollywood comedian Lucille Ball. It's wonderfully hilarious. It's comedy at its best. My Favorite Husband, starring Lucille Ball, every Saturday night on most of these same CBS stations. T-H-E-S-T-A-R-S-A-D-D-R-E-S-S I-S-C-B-S The star's address is C-B-S This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is CBS where you dance the music of Vaughn Monroe Saturday night for Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>